Um, and for kernel density estimation, there's there's a lot that could be covered. So I'm going to kind of gloss over and focus on some of the um, primary versions of this method that are used. Um, but I'd just like to note that you can definitely go more in depth um, by reading through the literature or looking at other ways this, this method can be, can be implemented um, in its different forms. All right. So I mentioned kernel density estimation is used to estimate a utilization distribution. Um, so what is kernel density estimation? Uh, so according to that Horn et al. chapter in 2020, uh, kernel density estimation has been used across scientific disciplines as a non-parametric approach to estimate an unknown probability distribution. Um, and this is particularly useful because a lot of these spatial patterns of animal movements are um, what would be considered non-parametric. Um, and kernel density estimation works by placing small kernels or bumps over each data point and then averaging the contribution from all kernels to obtain an estimate of the probability distribution at any point in space. So we come up with these surfaces essentially of spatial intensity that are estimated by a kernel density function. And kernel density estimation is used for all kinds of other purposes, um, a lot of times in only one dimension. So if you've ever created a density plot, like what we did yesterday for there's different movement variables such as step length and turning angle and displacements. Um, those are technically also using um, kernel density estimation a lot of times, just in one dimension. Uh, so in this case, we're using it in two dimensions for space use. Uh, according to Warden from 1989, this is kind of the initial paper that introduced kernel density estimation as a way to estimate space use for animal movement ecology. Um, he says that kernel methods free the utilization distribution estimates from parametric assumptions and provides a means of smoothing locational data <clears throat> to make more efficient use of them than a histogram. So again, denoting that this is a, a non-parametric method to be able to estimate and smooth out these, these points in space. And then another uh, seminal paper on this topic uh, from Seaman and Powell in 1996. In the context of home range analysis, the density at any location is an estimate of the amount of time spent there. This information informs a basis for ecological investigations of habitat use and preference. The density also forms a basis for measuring the overlap of individuals or species in terms of the area and intensity of use or the volume. Um, so I think there's some nice tidbits in this quote particularly um, basically thinking about the intensity as a way to um, look at the amount of time different animals are spending across the landscape, um, especially when trying to consider this with respect to maybe habitat preferences or uh, habitat selection. And then you could even use these estimates of space use from these probability density functions, such as kernel density estimation, to look at overlap of individuals by instead of just the 2D overlap, of different areas, we're looking at 3D overlap of volumes. So if you look on the right here, um, this figure from Fleming and Calabrese in 2017, the left side that's colored um, shows this, this probability density surface. So the blue colors, the cooler colors denotes very low probability of an animal occurring there, whereas the warmer colors that are up to a red color denote high probability. So we can see these two different peaks essentially on this surface. And let's say this is one individual that was estimated by a kernel density estimation. Um, you can take multiple individuals to look at uh, potentially the overlap <clears throat> of their space use, at least at a static time period. <clears throat> let's say they were tagged over a year and you wanna look at how much space overlaps across these individuals for that year. Alternatively, you can estimate uh, this UD at different time intervals, let's say each month or each season, to look at seasonal or even uh, daily comparisons of space use. And then the bottom right here is our uh, mathematical expression for potentially estimating a kernel, uh, making a kernel density estimate. So on the left side, 
of the expression. Um, this is our probability density function evaluated at the coordinates of x. So again, consider x as a two um, element vector. <clears throat> one is the x coordinate, one is the y coordinates. Then n here is our number of points in our data set that we're analyzing. H is going to be referred to as our smoothing bandwidth. So this is what makes the surface very smooth. Um, or maybe there's more peaks and different uh, hot spots potentially broken up across this, this surface, depending on the size or the value of this smoothing bandwidth H. And then in this expression is uh, capital K, which represents a bivariate kernel uh, probability density function. And like I mentioned before, this could be a few different types that are commonly used. Uh, probably the most common is a bivariate normal distribution. Um, alternatively, uh, something that's sometimes used is what's called an Epinechnikov kernel. And I'm pretty sure, I forget exactly, but I'm pretty sure this is essentially similar to like a bivariate T distribution where it just has like fatter tails essentially. Um, but you could essentially plug in multiple different types of uh, probability density functions here for K. Um, okay, I thought I had one more label. <clears throat> I guess not. Um, but this capital X here in this expression represents all of the other coordinates um, as part of this data set where it's taking this, this difference here. So to provide some caveats regarding the use of kernel density estimation, um, I'd like to acknowledge that kernel density estimation is widely used in the spatial ecology literature for animal movements. Um, it's especially highly used in, I would say, the marine literature. And there are definitely some more recent methods that probably uh, make better estimates of space use, whether it's the occurrence distribution or the range distribution, um, of which few have been implemented up till this point, um, but they are starting to be more widely used in uh, terrestrial studies. So um, hopefully they'll be used also more frequently in marine studies as well. Um, but the choice of the bandwidth estimator H is of critical importance. So the bivariate kernel that you choose, whether it's the bivariate normal or the Epinechnikov kernel, <clears throat> isn't as important to make these estimates of space use compared to this bandwidth estimator. And that's because, again, it controls the smoothing and therefore the intensity of this density surface. So if you have a really large value for, for H for your bandwidth, um, this might completely smooth out the, the intensity surface and therefore potentially uh, signify a larger area used by a given individual or population than would actually be expected. Um, and this method was originally developed for uh, estimating UDs based on VHF, so very high frequency radio telemetry, where autocorrelation wasn't much of an issue. So um, when radio telemetry studies were more frequent, whether in terrestrial or marine studies, um, people typically had much less frequent uh, observations and they might've spanned over like, the course of days between subsequent observations. Um, so in general, you can consider these, these different points um, independent and identically distributed, which is not the case for modern telemetry data sets where they're being reported <clears throat> typically multiple times a day, if not multiple times an hour. Um, so there's a lot of high autocorrelation present in animal movement tracks that should be accounted for because otherwise it's violating the assumptions of kernel density estimation. So by default, kernel density estimation assumes that all these points are independent of one another. There's no autocorrelation present. And again, that is not the case in most modern telemetry data sets. <clears throat> um, so this figure on the bottom shows this true distribution on the left side and then um, examples of estimated distributions based on different values of a uh, bandwidth that parameter H. So in the middle, it's showing um, a small value for H for that bandwidth. So there's these like a, a bunch of peaks and really highly fragmented utilization distribution that's often estimated. Whereas to the right of that, the opposite is if you have a larger value of H, it smooths, smooths this surface out much more. <clears throat> um, 
So just kind of uh, illustrating uh, what I what I was mentioning previously. Another uh, set of caveats to consider is that uh, these estimates will be highly impacted by location error. And this probably goes for most, most methods you would use to estimate space use, but I want to explicitly discuss this topic um, while we're covering kernel density estimation. Um, and that's because large errors will ultimately result in large utilization distributions. So it's not, not necessarily to say that animals use larger area use had less precision on your locations for your tracks. Um, so particularly for Argos tracks, these are typically associated with large errors in space. Um, so therefore result in large utilization distributions. Whereas uh, estimates of U UDs with fast log GPS by comparison, typically will result in smaller utilization distributions, even for the same individual that may have been tagged with both methods. Um, so I like this figure here from Thompson and colleagues that show um, the estimated size of a utilization distribution when considering only um, a set of points from different location classes, whether for Argos or FastLog GPS. So for FastLog GPS, it's showing the number of satellites. <clears throat> but we can see starting from the left side of the x-axis, that home range shown on the y-axis is very large. And then this starts to drop off precipitously as you move from class B to class A, and then from class A to classes one through three for Argos. And then once you hit fast log GPS for four satellites all the way up through um, nine satellites, essentially, it's showing that the, the UD estimates is stable. It's not changing. And it's very small by comparison to um, especially the A and B uh, classes of Argos, but even smaller than the, the best Argos location classes. Another uh, figure from this paper or set of figures that I think illustrates this point well um, is shown here. So if we look at the kind of left plot of these two, uh, that shows the Argos and FastLog GPS. The, the Argos column on the left is showing um, tracks from different individuals. So each row is a different individual. And the Argos is showing the entire uh, set of points throughout this entire region. And the main uh, focal region is shown in that red box. That's kind of hard to see here on at least the projection screen. Um, and by comparison to the right of that is the same region shown in that red box, but for fast log GPS. So we see that there's a much um, kind of clearer image of where these points are actually occurring. So to see uh, the zoomed in version of those Argos tracks compared to the FastLog GPS, if you look to the far right side, um, it shows those side by side for each row. And you can see for FastLog GPS, there's these really fine scale clumps of points and these patterns through space. And those do not match up at all um, with these Argos, these Argos uh, observations um, to the left side. So again, just emphasizing that um, if possible, the, the higher your precision, the higher your accuracy of your locations, uh, the better the estimates and likely the smaller the, the space use size that you will estimate for your, your individuals. Okay, so I talked about the importance of estimating um, a smoothing bandwidth for kernel density estimation. And now I'm gonna touch on some of the most common ones that are being used and what those essentially look like. Um, so the, the three that I'll be covering are the reference bandwidth, the least squares cross-validation method to estimate bandwidth, and the plug-in method. Um, and a, a study or comparison made by Walter and colleagues from 2015 looked at a bunch of different other methods as well, but I wanted to highlight uh, these three different uh, bandwidth estimators here for this particular set of uh, tracks for Florida Panthers. So we can see um, denoted by H is the smoothing bandwidth and then the subscript shows which method was used. So the top left is showing the least squares cross validation method. And we see that these, these space use, um, basically surfaces or intensity is highly concentrated around all of the different points um, in this tagged individual. Whereas to the right of that, when using the reference bandwidth estimator, um, it smooths this out much more over a much larger area. 
um, potentially larger than the area the animal would actually use. And then the bottom left is the plug-in method to estimate the bandwidth parameter. And this is kind of a, a trade-off between these two methods, between least squares cross-validation and the reference bandwidth. So the reference method is typically best suited to a unimodal distribution. And that's because it's using an expression from a bivariate normal distribution, which assumes a single peak in space. So if your points look something like this, where you have a single clump of points, um, this method would probably actually do a pretty good job of estimating that. Um, so again, yeah, derived from a bivariate normal distribution where the the value of this bandwidth is estimated by minimizing the mean integrated square error. And this is typically estimating a single bandwidth for both coordinate dimensions, although I think it is technically possible to estimate it in the X and Y dimensions. These are typically used more frequently for these other two methods, the least squares cross validation and plug in bandwidth methods. Um, and since most tracks typically exhibit a multimodal distribution, so there's more than one like clump of points or cluster of points, um, this assumption for this reference bandwidth method will typically violate the unimodal assumption and overestimate the utilization distribution. So in general, this is not a good method to use, although it is widely still used in the literature and is available readily in different R packages. Um, in general, this might be a good starting point, but it should not be something you use for your final product to measure space use. And to provide a brief mathematical expression here for estimating this reference bandwidth um, based on the bivariate normal kind of probability density function, we have this expression here where we take the square root of sigma squared and th this sigma squared parameter is the average marginal covariance um, from these X and Y coordinates from your data sets. And N here is the, didn't change that. That's supposed to be your sample size. Um, so N is the sample size and the, the sigma squared is the average marginal covariance from your X and Y coordinates. And these are both determined from your data set. So nothing else is needed here. Um, Moving on to the next method, the least squares cross validation method. Um, this examines a potential range of bandwidths and finds the one that minimizes the error between the potential true and the estimated distribution. Um, so this will often use the reference bandwidth as a starting point. And once that's calculated, it'll use a range based on the fraction of the reference bandwidth. So let's say the reference bandwidth was estimated to be two, maybe, um, the least squares cross validation method will test possible values from half of two, so one, all the way up to like two times two, so four, um, in different increments. Maybe it's every half value, it'll test up till four. So from one to one and a half, two to two and a half, all the way to four. And then whichever value of that smoothing bandwidth is has the least error, that will be determined as the, the optimal bandwidth based on this method. Um, and this can also be used to estimate bandwidth separately in the X and Y dimension. So you have a different level of smoothing in these different dimensions. And in general, as the time interval of the track decreases, so will the bandwidth estimates. So if you're sampling tracks at a 30 minute interval compared to like a four hour interval, um, these UD estimates based on this least squares cross validation method will more tightly cover the tracks. So it won't be as kind of diffuse by comparison to tracks that were sampled over a longer time interval. Uh, and typically as the sample size increases, that tends to pose a problem for this method and event or occasionally this method may fail to determine an optimal um, value based on the range that you've considered. So that can be problematic in some circumstances. Um, and this method tends to provide better estimates for tracks when the points um, tend to be tightly clumped into multiple groups. Um, but if maybe the, the tracks are generally diffuse or maybe there's one major single clump but everything else is kind of spread out around it, um, there may be other methods that could be 
performing better or equally well. Um, and then this, this figure to the right from a recent paper by Kristen Hart and colleagues shows um, different utilization distributions for loggerhead turtles in northeastern Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, here off the coast of Florida in the Big Bend region. Um, and the colors are denoting the, the different initial tagging site from where these, these uh, loggerhead turtles were tagged. And this was done using these squares cross validation. Okay, so our last major uh, bandwidth estimation method I'm gonna touch on here is the plug-in method. And this uses theoretical pilot bandwidth values to minimize the error function and then plugs these values in directly to the equation to then be minimized. Um, so it's using a slightly different approach and can also similar to least squares cross validation estimate separate bandwidth values in the X and Y dimensions, um, but may over smooth utilization distributions if the points are actually truly separated into distinct clusters. So in this case, the least squares cross validation method may perform better. Um, but if the points are only slightly clustered or spread out, this method performs better or as well as least squares cross validation. But in general, the plugin method and the least squares cross validation will typically outperform the reference bandwidth method. And here on the right is a figure from Pagano and colleagues from last year showing space use of um, polar bears in the Arctic. Okay, so a method that I wanted to mention and briefly uh, just, just a, a yeah. Question. I'm wondering uh, why all of those methods are associated with the letter H? So H is the uh, parameter, essentially the, the label given for the band, the smoothing band. So the, the subscript is denoting the method used to estimate that bandwidth. Uh, but H, like I showed in the, the original equation for that kernel density slide at the beginning, um, is just like what's used to represent that, that bandwidth value. Because of the last letter from bandwidth? I have no idea. <laughs> That's just what's been used traditionally. So mm -hmm. if you see stuff for, um, I think a lot of times the aid habitat HR, like package that people will use, um, it always refers to the, the bandwidth by H, H ref, H L C L S C V, H plugin, and you'll see that in other contexts as well. So if you ever see a like H with a subscript, it's talking about this smoothing bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not sure why they use H, but that's at least what's generally accepted as the, the bandwidth value. Okay. So um, I'm not going to be covering autocorrelated uh, kernel density estimation during this workshop. Um, but I did want to briefly discuss it um, because this is, I think, an important method that should be used more widely, depending on the, the research goals you have in your data sets. Um, but autocorrelated KDE or AKDE can explicitly account for temporal autocorrelation in your tracks um, and can properly account for this dependence and success of observations, unlike <coughs> traditional uh, kernel density estimation methods. So like I mentioned earlier on, uh, tip, traditional kernel density estimation uh, violates the assumption of uh, independent and identically distributed points through space. Um, by comparison, AKDE actually accounts for this autocorrelation. So therefore, this is like a natural way to handle these, these points that you're collecting from telemetry. Um, and by comparison to some of the other uh, estimates that I showed earlier for kernel density estimation, um, that might estimate maybe the occurrence distribution uh, autocorrelated kernel density estimation actually is estimating the range distribution by comparison. So the potential areas that the animal may use in the future, potentially. Um, so this could be used for estimating home ranges and typically provides a uh, larger estimates than let's say the plug-in method or the least squares cross-validation method. And depending on the movement patterns of your tagged animals may even provide an excessively large estimate of space use if they're dispersing. Um, so if you have migrating individuals, especially spanning large regions, um, I would actually suggest or recommend to potentially not use this method as it, similar to minimum convex polygons, will generate this large area um, 
space contour that won't really capture the actual movements of your, your tagged animals. Um, but I wanted to touch on these figures on the right. So the, the figure on the top right from and Noonan et al. paper in 2019 is showing um, the estimate, kernel density estimates from traditional kernel, kernel density estimation in the left column and um, AKDE in the right column. So the top row is showing a set of points from a tracked animal. Uh, I forget what species this is, but uh, we can see this difference in this 95% uh, contour. So the left side again is traditional kernel density estimation. And this estimate is much smaller by comparison to AKDE on the right. But this is also holding out half of the, the track. Um, so if we add this other, the second half of the track back in, these gold points on the bottom row, we can see that this kernel density estimates um, from the traditional method basically only captures a few of the, the points in the second half of this track, but most of them fall outside of this 95% contour. Whereas by comparison for AKDE, it's actually able to capture the majority of these, these points in the second half of the track. So this is demonstrating that the, the AKDE can uh, potentially capture future areas that this animal may move to, and therefore is estimating the range distribution, not the occurrence distribution. Um, and the same thing is kind of highlighted here on the bottom from a figure by Silva and colleagues from this past year, where um, we have autocorrelated data sampled every hour for a buffalo on the left side, and then uncorrelated data, which we can consider independent and identically distributed on the right, where it's been subsampled to once every week. Um, so we see on the bottom row the estimates from the AKDE versus traditional KDE method. So for the autocorrelated data sampled every hour, the uh, traditional KDE actually underestimates, underestimates the area used by this tagged animal. Whereas on the right here, when we have the independent data set sampled every week, um, we actually see that it's um, overestimating the area by comparison. Um, so this is something again to consider depending on the movement patterns of your animals and um, the temporal autocorrelation present in your tracks. Okay, so now for some motivating examples of just what you could potentially do with kernel density estimation. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a, a map of uh, space use areas for sandhill cranes along the, the Texas coast here. Um, and each, each different contour or um, each different set of polygons could be attributed to different individuals tagged throughout the study. Although each individual may have multiple polygons representing its 95% uh, isoplef here. So one example is just estimating space use per individual throughout a region and looking at potential overlap among those individuals. Additionally, you can also make these comparisons by age class. So this study, um, I do not want to pronounce that name, so I will mispronounce it, um, but a study conducted in 2021 on a uh, vulture species is showing this, this difference um, between adults and immature or juvenile individuals and showing this difference in space use. So immature individuals are typically using a broader area and these uh, kind of core areas are in different locations compared to the adults. And this could be due to a number of different reasons, potentially based on the biology of the species. Um, a study conducted by Evans and colleagues in 2021 on leatherbacks in the Northwest Atlantic um, shows basically the movements of a bunch of different uh, leatherback turtles throughout this entire region, including the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Northwest Atlantic along the coast of North America, and even across the Atlantic along the coast of Africa and Europe. Um, so just covering these like ocean basin scale movements of, of migrating animals. And lastly, another example is uh, a study by Simfendorfer and colleagues on um, freshwater eels and actually taking this a step further beyond just um, utilization distributions or space use in two dimensions to also accounting for three dimensions of so depth within the water column. 
So you can see these, these 3D hyper volumes of space use uh, of these different individuals. And if you were to map that out into 2D space, we can see that here on this map. Um, but obviously this is not capturing the full uh, kind of idea here where there's some individuals using shallower water and some using deeper water. So just because they overlap in two dimensions doesn't mean that they're actually using the same area because they are partitioning space uh, vertically in the water column. All right, so with that, um, we can start calculating KDEs, but first I would say let's take a break